Technical session number 18. Today is where it starts to get pretty real. We start peeling back the curtain a little bit on some of this stuff and talking about how these systems interconnect because a computer by itself, that's okay. You can do a couple of things, but the real benefits and increased productivity and stuff happens when you can link computers together and share resources and computing power and things like that. So that's when a lot of the exciting stuff starts to really begin. In this particular technical session, we are going to be talking about different types of networks. We're gonna be giving some examples of these networks. So we're gonna be talking about PANs, WANs, LANs, MANs, WLANs, all that kind of stuff, being able to describe what it is. We're gonna be getting into physical topologies, talking about different types of physical networks and how they kind of lay out uh, what they look like. So we're gonna be talking about star networks, ring networks, uh, buses, which not many people use anymore, but they do use them for network segments, Hi, mesh Bruce. networks, you know, stuff like that. Um, we're also gonna be talking about different types of network cables, getting into the coax again, our twisted pairs, um also into some fiber optics we do have to be able to identify a lot of these connectors so we will be getting into that when we're talking about twisted pair we're going to be talking about wiring standards things like that yes we do need to know the wiring standards for twisted pairs don't worry we have a little mnemonic for you to help remember both sets that you need to know we're going to be talking about the most common network tools. Some of this is review. We did talk about this in week one, but it's good to go back over it again, get a little bit better look at it and do a little bit more of a deep dive today. Growth mindset. I know it's stressful. This is a lot to take in. Feels like you're drinking from a fire hose, but maintain that growth mindset. You can develop these skills. I promise you. If you didn't think you could, or if it wasn't possible, why are you here? Why do you come in and torture yourself every day? Because you really, like Kelly. You okay. what? maybe, maybe I'm a little sadistic. There you All go. Right? Well, that'd be, that'd be more masochistic, you know, like I, I like torturing myself, you know, but um, yes. So, you know, you, you may want to come in here and torture yourself a little bit, but we actually believe this is possible. We can gain these skills and change the trajectory of our life. We can get out of careers we don't like, get into careers that are more have more opportunity and maybe help us move around the world if that's what we want to do or start getting involved in something like me where I actually believe in this. I actually enjoy this. It's weird when you finally get into a job experience where you're actually having fun. Or really excited to learn about it and then adaptability that's everything in it it's constantly changing new stuff's always being thrown out at you so you have to be able to change with it how do we be how are we successful in it who remembers this one how do we become successful in it we eat elephants i learn eat elephants <laughs> We never stop learning, Kelly. Never stop, never learning. stop learning. But how I mean, but how are you going to be successful in something? You got to be interested in it. Because the funny thing in our lives, we always seem to find time for the things we're interested in. If you're interested in sports, you learn all the stats, you learn all the players, know where they came up from, whether it be high school, college pro so you've followed their careers this whole time you know their stats and all that stuff you're interested in it you make the time be interested in it you'll make the time you'll be more excited to learn about it and you'll progress much faster kelly i just want to ask are you familiar with um i think i asked you this previously but i forgot your response do you know the correlation be between basic IT and health IT? Is it just like different um, software systems? Or I think I asked you this before. Is it all like basically IT is all the same, no matter if it's health information technology or like system technology? A lot of the underlying basics never change. But when they're speaking of healthcare IT, they're typically speaking of specific operating systems and programs that they use. And also you're gonna be working with some of the um, 
equipment as well. I have uh, one of my best friends growing up uh, works for a company that does all the coding for MRI machines. You know, so quite literally, he's flying all over the country, going to different hospitals to correct and update the software and stuff on MRIs, make sure they run differently. But the underlying principles are very much the same when he started learning, you know, IT back when he was in high school. He's like, not a lot of that's changed. You know, the underlying principles stay the same. It's Thank just you, the, the programs and the bells and whistles kind of change. So excellent question, though. All right. First, before we start talking about networks, we need to know what exactly is a network. Essentially, it's what it does is it links computers together for communication, for sharing information and resources. The collective knowledge of the group is far more than the individual. Same is true for networks. The collective knowledge of the entire network is going to be far greater than the capabilities of a single machine or system. So working together, we can achieve much more significant things. So a network in general must provide connections. So they have to have a way to communicate. There's a variety of ways we can do that. We'll talk about that. Communications. So they kind of have to be speaking the same language via applications and programs, systems and kind of services so like is you know is one system going to offer up um, all the resources like the storage for everybody else like all your data and documents and research stored in one system or are you going to be operating on a peer-to-peer -peer network where it's kind of everybody sharing with everybody else uh no main system is the controller um just basically you share access to information amongst yourselves this hat this works really well in small networks the larger the networks get, uh, the less viable this is. Different components of a network. So you have the server. That is going to be your one of your primary devices on the network. It serves up resources to everybody else. And thankfully, they're pretty easily named. If you have an email server, it's not providing firewall services. It's pretty much your email. So you have an email server, does email. You have a web server, does web services. You have a file server, storage. Proxy server acts on behalf of a user. We'll talk about all these in a future T session now. You also have network devices to be able to create a network. You need switches, routers, hubs, bridges, things like that. Each of these serve different purposes. They operate on different layers of the network. And they provide essentially access points so that we can essentially get onto the network and communicate with other systems. And then media <laughs> via interconnect devices. These could be wired or wireless. You know, what way are we transmitting that data are we doing it over copper cable like in coax or in twisted pair or are we doing this over fiber optic using light or are we using radio waves over wi-fi what form of media are we using don't worry cynthia this lecture only takes four hours i promise we'll get at least one break in there All right. I, I feel like this would be more interesting than printers, though. 100%. There is a lot more going on. It's already more printer. interesting. That's hurtful. <laughs> hey, hey, don't act like you like printers, bro. Yeah, you don't Kelly, like printers. You, were, uh, you were lagging there at the end. We all heard it. I know. Well, I mean, I do find the workings of the laser printer fascinating from an engineering perspective. That's overall, one printer, yeah, you're right. Kelly, you're I know. Right. Overall, yeah, you're right. And then, and then 3D and printers. Yeah, like, you laser. a little extra rock, like yesterday. Like, you were like, there's a little extra rock, like, after everything you said. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, yeah, laser printers and 3D printers, I actually, like, 3D printers, especially, I'm very excited about because of where that technology is going. But... You know, lasers from an engineering perspective are interesting. The others are kind of meh. So I get it. Okay. Wait, one one quick question. 3D printers. Isn't that technically teleportation? 
because you can literally send the same thing to another 3D printer and then boom. Like uh, I don't know about that. I mean, because it's not the same, exact same it's item. More, it's more like cloning. Than there you go. I, I could go with that. Cloning would make more sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, all, all right. right. All right. So no problem. So we do have a variety of networks here. We have mesh, ring, bus, star, hybrid. And what does all this mean? Well, this is exact, you know, this would be what are called physical topologies, how the networks are set up. So you have to start with the most basic and the oldest and work your way up from there. Oldest one, bus network. It essentially is computers essentially in a line, like a bus. And then they would have a coax running along the bus segment. And then a line connecting each computer. So this is one of the oldest forms of networking. And on the old coax systems, they used to actually have to put a terminator device on the end of each side of the coax. And what this would do is essentially it would eat the signal and prevent it from being reflected back down the line. So they would set a terminator on either end. You have the three. You could have multiple in there, but here we have three, obviously. And they used to run the coaxes through the ceiling. And then they had what was called a vampire connector, which is like a little metal spike that would stick into the wire. And then they would literally drop it down out of the ceiling. That's why they call whenever they put a network port in, they always call it a drop because they literally would drop it down from the ceiling. Um, and all these would hook into the same line, that little metal spike in their coaxial cable. And the problem was if there was a break anywhere on this line, the entire network goes down. Done. Now we don't use the vampire connections. We actually use T connections with the B and C type connectors, but we'll show that later. So any break anywhere on this and it's done. This was typically a peer-to-peer -peer network. The other problem we had was we would have what's called data collisions. Data collisions occur when two computers try to talk at the exact same time. So the data literally collides on the line and doesn't make sense to the other systems when that happens. So we had to find a way to handle this. And uh, was it CDSM? C. D, no, CA. Carrier Sense, is it multi? I can't remember the acronym. DW, save me. CSMA, CD. There we go. Carrier Sense Multiple Assurance. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Be now a moment. Thank you. Carrier Sense Multiple Assurance slash CD, which is Collision Detection. Gosh, it's the first time I've forgotten that. Carrier Sense. Multiple assurance slash C D. Basically, what this does when the collision is detected, both systems back off and stop talking. So they back off, stop talking, and then they roll, you know, they they generate a random number, like rolling a dice with like a million options on it. And that says you're gonna wait X amount of milliseconds before you try to communicate again, and then when they both try to communicate, they're not trying to communicate again at the same time and cause another collision. So when it listens to the line, it knows somebody's talking and it will wait until they're done and then communicate. What's That's how this CD works. stand for again? Collision detection. Okay. So it's detecting that a collision has occurred. Both computers back off, generate a random number to wait, and then start trying to talk again. So as wonderful a technology as this is, what happens as we add more and more and more computers to it? More collisions. More collisions. It gets slower. It 
gets slower because of all these collisions, because you keep having these data collisions, everybody has to back off, it keeps happening. And data so, loss. Yep. Yeah. Well, they do resends after that. So this is where, you know, something like a bus network or something like that, where we're using this, it works in small numbers. It does not work in a large scale. So in order to make this a little bit more efficient, we moved on to the ring network. Still uses the carrier sense multiple assurance collision detection, but systems are set up in a fun ring format. So originally I think it was called token ring, but this also is not one that is widely used anymore. It was a little bit better than the bus. It still has that single point of failure where if you lose a single uh, segment, the whole network goes down, but also has the added problem if a single computer goes down the ring goes down because it interrupts that connection. It doesn't allow the data to flow. <clears throat> and all the nodes are connected essentially in a sequential line. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five. So also an older topology. So now we got to get a little bit fancier. You're drawing pretty well, Kelly, with just one hand. Who draws with two hands? Like a crayon like this? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the drawings get worse. I, pro I promise you, Casey, yeah, I appreciate it, but they do get worse. Um, especially when we start getting into uh, submitting. All right. So next, we upgraded to something called a mesh network. So mesh network is kind of awesome. You know, it can work uh, pretty well. The internet in general is, is a kind of mesh network, <clears throat> but from a physical sense in a office, a mesh network is essentially, instead of having a ring where computer one's connected to two, then to three, then to four, then to five, um, each computer is connected to every other computer. So you have the mesh here, this one goes here, this one goes there, this one goes here, this one goes there. And make sure I got everybody, I'm missing one. Ah, here to here. So each computer is connected to every other computer. Awesome, right? Now, if I lose this line, Computer one here can transfer now to computer three and then back up to computer two. So it allows us to create multiple pathways to communicate with each system. Pretty awesome, right? It's very Which hard to that? bring. This is called a mesh network. Oh, okay. So we got a mesh. So I can bring down a single computer. That doesn't bring down the system either because. The other four are still able to communicate with each other. So there is no single point of failure. Every computer is connected to everyone else. Awesome, right? No, Here's the problem. Uh, okay, here we go. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. What happens if I have what happens if I have 50 computers? Slow network, bro. It's not like, necessarily a slow network. How many came? It's like a couple thousand cables, right? Yeah, it's a lot of cabling because every computer has to have a network port for every other computer on that network. They even have a formula for it. Yes, you do need to know it. So for us to figure out how many cables we're gonna need, so you have the number of cables, which is in, times n minus one divided by two. 
So if I have five computers, how many cables am I going to need? So I put it in here, five times five minus one, which is four. So five times four is 20 divided by two gives me 10. 10, yeah. So I need 10 cables and I need 10 network connections for every single computer. So as amazing as a mesh network is, right? And as robust and hard as it is to bring down, it's difficult to scale. Bobo Uh Is the mess used uh, in like disaster related events like hurricanes? They use the mess uh, topology? Well, they'll use a wireless mesh topology to, wireless. Co to cover the area. That's a little different, but, okay. um, but this is physical wires. So this is, we haven't even gotten into wireless yet. This is all physical wires running between computers. Okay. So great question though. It's just a little bit further down. Casey, did you have a question too? I was just wondering, man, that must be a lot of money. If you think yes. about it. Cost wise, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. To set up a mesh network. But if, if having this network to be as robust as possible and make sure it never goes down, that would be an option for a small number of computers. And wouldn't that also look like give off uh, electromagnetic, um, like some of these cables? So- Oh, like you're talking about yeah, EMI, electromagnetic interference? Yeah. So Possibly, must... but a lot, but you can use shielded cables. But they're not always, unless they're like, the fiber cables that won't be a sure thing right I mean, it's still going to give off even a little bit right yes but the thing is is it's giving off a little bit but the others are shielded from each other so you can run oh. a ton of cables with shielding and yeah. they'll be fine yeah it doesn't so need each to one's be giving up a little bit i have shielding well fiber optic is the only thing immune to emi but we'll talk about that in a little bit and how much are those just kind of curious just wondering what, like what, fiber optic uh, fiber yeah depends on where you live <clears throat> me where i'm at it doesn't matter how much i pay i can't get fiber optic even though uh at&t came through here and told me they'd be here yeah, we would have fiber in three months that was back in 2015 still not here is that because florida is kind of swampy and it's not good to inlay cables into the ground mm -hmm. Nope, it's because it's costly to set up that infrastructure and they want to make sure there's enough people wanting that service before they will install it and be able to use it. So you need to, you need to move in a good area, Kelly. <laughs> I live in an old neighborhood. <laughs> so they uh, they focus on putting fiber in the newer developments at this point. But so mesh network, we see it has some benefits, but in large networks, it isn't really feasible because if I had, let's, let's scale it up. Tell me how many kept network cables I would need. So we know if I have five computers, I need 10 cables. How many, if I have 10 computers, how many cables do I need? 20. 85. Yeah, you, you need, need at least 20, 25. So 10 okay. times nine gives me what, 90 divided by two is what? Not 40. 45. 45. Oh my so God. This is... With five computers, I need 10 connections. With 10 computers, I need 45. So it's exponential growth. Each one you add adds a lot more that is required. So as you can see, this does not scale very well. So we need another option. So our Kelly, next option, yo. Kelly, I could do it. I could do it. <laughs> you could do what? I could do the Star Network. And you start. Do the Star Network. You want to do the Star Network? Uh, I think I think I remember it. All right. Well, let me draw one box here. Ah, I lost my annotator. Here we go. All right. Adriel, walk us through it, sir. Come on. I may be wrong, though. I may be wrong. No. I, hey, you never know until you try. And we, what do we say day one? We got to get comfortable with the idea we may be wrong from time to time. Nobody's going to bust your chops if you're wrong. We're all here learning together, right? So I think that a star network is kind of like this. There's a computer in the middle that maintains everything. And each computer on the outside will be connected to said um, connect 
said connection in the middle and that's why you get the star um okay. you know star look to it and even if, the only way that this network would go down is if computer one would be the one that went out every other computer wouldn't ne wouldn't necessarily go out but but i think i think usually it's not really a computer anymore it's just mm -hmm. the network like the actual provider is sending it in and so you have what exactly would we put in the middle a server not a server or a server may be one of the nodes hmm. not a server oh like switch. a router it's a switch, switch. router okay, oh. yeah switch and router so would be good <clears throat> we would put a network well not a router excuse me sorry a switch or a hub Routers typically go on the edge of the network. Again, but it's still considered a network device. It is. So, so from a, a notation perspective, we wouldn't use the square because um, that would notate computers. So what they actually use would be typically a circle or a round box. Sometimes they, they invert it and you have squares for the routers and hubs, but just to kind of distinguish it, we would have some form of network device at the center, be it a switch or a hub. And again, like Pedro was saying, they don't really use hubs anymore. This is true, but in probably some smaller networks in older companies using legacy systems, you may still come across one of them. Or for a quick network segment, they may use a hub. So they still do serve some purposes. They work wonderfully for um, a quick device to do what's called port mirroring. And we'll explain why in just a minute. But you have some centralized network device, and each system is connected to it like a star. So it creates a little star network. And then you may have another line going out to the cloud or the internet, whatever you want to say. So that would be your router, which would be your gateway to get out of the network. So does this make sense? I think this is the most common wired connection that they yes. use as well. Yes. Yes, it is. It is the most common networking uh, standard used. Um, but we also have to talk about hybrid. As with everything else we've talked about, hybrid is just a combination of two. And in truth, the most common is the, it is a hybrid network, but it's called a star bus. So you have a bus network segment that connects to a star. That is the, hands down the most common in enterprise settings. But in small networks, star is absolutely the most common. So would a hybrid be, um, instead of just like one system implementing multiple um, networks, would it be say two that are connected? two separate network networks that are connected to make like a ring bus, for example? Yeah, well, you would have multiple network devices because the star would become a segment of that network. So the network can be something small, like at your house where you have three or four different devices, a phone, a tablet, a computer, whatnot. That would be a small network. And you would probably set something like that up um, as like a wireless mesh. Or okay. if you had like three computers, maybe set them up as a star. You have like a little switch, and then you hook up three computers together that way and they all can communicate and it works wonderfully. When you start getting scaling this up into large corporations, they may have a bus like if they're in a, if they're in a, a skyscraper. Um, so you have like floor one, floor two, floor three, floor four, you know what I'm saying? They may have a bus that runs vertically up the building to each floor. Okay. And then they connect that bus to a switch, and then they have a star. Gotcha. Yeah, on that's each what I was asking. Floor. So you're you're connecting multiple network segments together, depending on the size of that network, to make it run as efficiently as possible. So that that would be considered a hybrid. Yes, much. this would be a hybrid. This would be a star bus. So you have a bus, you have a star on each floor, and you connect all the floors together through a bus network. Okay. Nice. Does this make sense? Yeah, definitely. Okay, excellent. All right, so go to the next page and you can kind of see a much better visual representation than what I could draw, but I wanted to not distract you with all the different pictures, but give you a really terrible drawing for each one. So 
through here, we, we can see it. Here's our mesh. We can see a multitude of cables. Looks like a bird's nest running through there. No single point of failure. You can bring down any one wire, any one computer. You're still okay. You go to the common bus, any break in that wire, the entire network goes down. Ring network, same thing. Any break in a wire or a computer, entire network goes down because it moves sequentially through the network. Star network, computer one, computer three, computer four, any one of those computers can go down. The network is still fine. Only problem is, as Adrian was stating, there is a single point of failure in the center of that star, which is that hub or switch. So that is the vulnerability of the star network. It is right in the middle. So if that goes down, nobody else can talk. So thankfully you know, it is relatively rare for, for switches or hubs to go down. Yes, Galen. So if we had an issue, if we were called to, um, to have to work on one of these, right? If we had to work on the star network, if there was mm -hmm. an issue with the star network, more than likely the issue would be, the, the only issue would probably be in the center, right? Where the... <clears throat> Well, typically, if somebody is calling in, it may be an individual device that's having an, an issue communicating with the star. Now, if the entire network is down, yeah, you would go check the switch and see if the switch was OK. All right. So network issues just think switch automatically. So, well, no, not necessarily. You don't think switch automatically. So it may be, the, again, it may be at the computer. It may be in the, the medium, which is the wire that's communicating. Or it could be in, the, if it's in the centralized device, though, everybody's affected. Okay. okay so, gotcha. so say, if, you know, we had that star bus, like we talked about, where you had, you know, five floors. Um, each floor had its own star network, and there was a bus connecting them. If the fourth floor called and said their entire network was down, but everybody else was fine, I would go look at the network device for the fourth floor. I wouldn't be going to individual computers. Got it. All right, let's see here. Why don't we take about 15 minutes real quick, get up, walk around before we dive into the next subject. We can kind of process what we got here. I'll still be here for questions for those who need it. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording. Can you all still see my screen here? Yes, no? Where did it go away? Okay, I lost my uh, bordering, so I didn't know if it left. All right, so now we can talk about some types of networks by resource location. So we're going to talk a little bit about the client server network. And this is a network that contains both clients and servers. You can have networks where systems are both, um, but a server is just that. It's meant to serve the needs of the network. It is offering up resources and information for others to use. So you typically would have a server. I know this is confusing because we just talked about a star network, but you would have a server and then multiple systems connect to that server to get spreadsheets, documents, research and development, all that stuff stored in a central location like a server so that you can, everybody else can have access to those resources. The server has a switch within itself? No, I mean, this drawing kind of is a little bit confusing in that sense. This could be a star network where the server is one of the nodes. Think but basically, every time the, that you would put switch, instead of saying switch, just think of network device. Yeah. So that's essentially what we're thinking about when we're talking about client server. And then the, there's another type that we were talking about here a little bit. And then there's peer to peer. And that is where devices can be essentially both. They sometimes are offering up resources to others and sometimes they're getting resources from others. So they, they essentially say there's no servers, you know, but it's all clients. Everybody communicates with everybody. These work for very small networks. They all share the burden of communication. But when you start getting over roughly about 10, I know uh, was it Windows Home Network allows, I think it's up to 20 
But generally, when you get above 10 active users at any given time, then it bogs down the network almost to where it's unusable. Also, in order for a peer-to-peer -peer like this to work, you have to have the passwords. You have to have a sign-in and password for each computer. So think about this. You have 10 computers, 10 people working on it, and each person needs to have a sign-in and password for every other computer. Every three months, those have to change. How many passwords is that for you every month? Four. 10 times 10? 100. Oh, you're talking 100. about all of them, right? Not yes. One. I would wow. have like, so computer one would have to have a sign in and password for two, would have to have a sign in and password for three, would have to have a sign in and password for four. And then the same thing goes for everybody else that you need to have sign in and passwords for every system. So you're talking like 100 passwords and sign ins. Is this for all peer to peer? Not all, or but this is a typical. So it becomes cumbersome very quickly from a IT or network standpoint. So, so you said each in computer order to, needs a sign in and password for yes, in order for me computer? to gain for me to gain access to those resources, it typically would require a sign in and password for me to get those resources. Honestly, so, that kind of sounds like a like a college layout. I feel like that's like in a library. I feel like that that'd be like how it works, right? Like, where well, that, would you see that in real? Well, you would probably see it in a small, small office or a home office. You know, if like you had a small retail store and you, you know, you just had a couple of people working on, you know, data or whatever, you might do that all internally and just do a peer to peer network. No need for anything else. It's not super common, you know, but you may also use it in your house if you're just sharing media. Like if you have, one computer that has a bunch of movies on it, somebody else stores all the photographs and stuff like that. Or maybe you have a computer in your office that is your work computer, but you also have one, like a tablet that you use, you're, you're able to use those access, but you can set that up as a peer-to-peer -peer sharing situation. Those would be situations where you would see it. Like home groups, small offices, things like that. Again, you get more than 10 people, it becomes overly cumbersome on the network and tends to not function very well. So this type of network scenario, you tend to outgrow very quickly if you're a startup business. All right. Let's start talking about everyday life. The PAN or personal area network. Easy way to think about this is within arm's reach. You know, this is a personal network for you. We typically all have PANs. If you have Bluetooth headset hooked up to your phone on a regular basis, you got a smartwatch <clears throat> hooked up to your cell phone. If you wirelessly sync to your computer or wirelessly print to a computer or print to a printer, excuse me, all of this is a PAN. It is a small personalized network for you. And yes, this can be a network segment attached to a larger network. <clears throat> so Bluetooth, FireWire, USB, wires, things like that. This would be the mediums by which you would communicate on a PAN or personal area network. Sometimes it may include more than one PC because you may be sharing information between two computers of yours, but typically phones, peripheral devices, keyboards, video games, wireless, you know, mice, headsets, all that stuff. That is your PAN, your personal network devices for you. Does this make sense? Yes. All right. So you typically have a central device, like a, co a controlling device. So your computer may be the central device connected to your, you know, your keyboards, your microphones, your what, your webcam, uh, printer, all that stuff. That would be a pan because you have that centralized controlling device. All right. As fun as and awesome as a pan is, let's expand that out a little bit. 
go to a LAN or a local area network. Now a LAN can use all of the topologies we talked about before, the mesh, the star, the ring, the bus, and the hybrid. All of that can operate on a LAN. This is a logical topology type of network. So it's, connections, it's a collection of computers located in a relatively small space, like an office or building. So it doesn't get bigger than a building usually. So that's your LAN. They're all connected by a common medium, be that fiber optic, twisted, uh, twisted pair, wire, wireless mesh, what have you. So they're all connected by a common medium. They allow the sharing of data, peripherals, software, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty high speed, relatively inexpensive to set up. and typically most common. So about the size of a building or less, local area network. Now we can get into the WLANs or wireless local area networks. This is, we use a lot of this at our home uh, where you have a centralized device that essentially sends out a signal for everybody else to use to share in the network connection. It can be public and unsecure. Those two things go together. If it's public, it's generally unsecure or private and secure. Gives you a little bit more flexibility. You don't need to have a wire chasing you around or hook you know, up to a network drop or what have you. You get a lot more mobility. But again, typically located in a very small area, much like a LAN. So LAN, smaller area, up to the size of about a building, about the same here, smaller building generally because the central router doesn't communicate uh, very far usually, but you have a lot more mobility. Standing out just a little bit more, we get the wireless mesh. Does anybody have these little nodes that you get from Comcast or whatever to you put around your house so you get better Wi-Fi signals or whatnot? Does anybody have that at their house or apartment? No, but I was thinking about putting it up because... What it is, is, it is it's a series of wireless access points or WAPs, W-A-P, so it's a series of wireless access points that are controlled by a master device. Each of these WAPs are considered an AP or access point to get onto the network. And you are able to seamlessly transfer from one to the other. So you're connected to one, and then if you get too far from the first one, it'll automatically be picked up by the second. So you can move through a larger building. If you've ever been walking through the buildings, you see those little pods sticking down from the ceiling, those little um, antennas, wireless antennas sticking down. They have them in hospitals, colleges, uh, larger office buildings, things like that. They all work together. And so you have the main device, which would say like be this device. And all of them have the same SSID or service set identifier, which is usually the use, like the name of the network and password. So they all have the same network ID and password. So it doesn't matter where you are, you're still signing on with the same username and password. All instructions filter out from the primary device. So if I change the, the network name and password on the primary device, it pushes that information out to all of the others. This allows you to operate over a much larger area rather than the length or the width of a single antenna or wireless device, which generally gets you, what, about 25, 30 feet or something like that. You now can cover an entire building with the wireless mesh network. Or, you know, up to a campus as well. I've seen them have them. Yes, bubble car. Oh, is it like... Uh... Uh, a device that extends the network, uh, let's say the signal, the network signal. Let's say you have it, you have a Wi-Fi in your in your apartment, mm -hmm. and you want to have a strong Wi-Fi when you get down to the pool or when you're in your patio. Yeah. Like some 
Yeah. Okay. Because I've seen some. So it does. It does yeah. It does. It, that's what you do to extend the network. You're using a mesh. So you have the yeah. main controlling device, which would be your your main router at the house, and then the other nodes would pass through information to that to that node. I have a question. Okay. Cool. Um, what would the humidity level for that be exactly? Like, you can't just stick in a garage somewhere. Like, does it have the same? Well, the, the humidity isn't isn't as much of an issue in the garage. I mean, yeah, because you can get the condensation and stuff like that on the device, but more so the heat. Oh. You know, so like, I wouldn't want to put a switch in my attic in Florida. It would cook the it would cook the switch in probably one summer. So I would typically put it in a closet inside the house in order to have better airflow and stuff like that. Now, if I was living in say New York, it probably wouldn't be as big of a deal for me to put my switch or router in the garage. I see. The summers, the summers aren't as hot. It's right. more the heat than the humidity. The humidity will hurt you over time. The heat can be detrimental in a single instance. Okay, because I wanted to sense. extend my range, but uh, I can't go past the garage for some reason, and that's what I was okay. thinking. There, but, may be uh, other, I there may be other options. There may be other options. I don't know, but I don't know, but I got. I have the plug-in extender. Let me, I'm going to put it up right here. It looks like this. Yeah, I don't know if you have to see it, but you just plug it mm -hmm. in, yeah, and then it, it extends the Wi-Fi. So I have like a few of them all over my yeah. house. Yeah, that that um, sometimes that's considered a mesh. Sometimes it's it's just kind of a replicator. Um, it's not part of it. Like there are some security um, protocols that will not allow you to pass through. Like uh, Uline had one that would be a wireless extender that you could buy and use it for any network. And um, if I tried to use it for certain systems, it would not allow it because it was thinking it was jumping through a proxy server. So depending on the ones you have set up, those may work. Although they do have some really good uh, mesh networks that you can get now, like one's called EO, I think it is. Um, I know Comcast has the pods that comes with their systems that'll automatically do it. So there are some options out there that you can use. Um, yes, bubble car. And is it wise to use uh, the extender, like for security wise, like hackers I mean, can be, they can the thing be close is, to your house and then be able to access your network? Again, they still would have to have the sign in and password for your network. Um, there are ways you can crack a Wi Fi, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more when we get to security. But more so, systems you're using may think there is a security problem because of the pass through. They may think there's a man in the middle attack. They may think there is a proxy server in place that's, you know, basically trying to siphon your information. So certain systems may not work and say, like, no, uh, we're detecting, you know, you know, a secondary server or something like that, and it's not going to allow you to pass through. So that does happen. But again, we'll get a little bit more into this when we talk about security. So in any case, wireless mesh networks allows you to extend a wireless network over a much larger area than you would with a single device. They all kind of interconnect and work together. Kelly, right. how, how effective um, is the mesh network? Um, do you do you have it? Have you have you ever you know installed it and used it at home um, in terms of like you know extending your your bolstering your um, Wi-Fi? Um, with range extenders, I have not had much success. Uh, but with the mesh, like the nodes and the EO and stuff like that, I've set those mm -hmm. up at like my father's house and then at uh, my cousin's house. And those mm -hmm. have worked beautifully. Okay. Um, at my house, I use something called, um, is it, it's basically, it's called EOP, which is Ethernet over power. And I'm thoroughly happy with that. But I'll yeah, talk about that. No. So that's, that's the ones I typically use just because I'm using a wired connection is much more consistent and and typically has higher speeds. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's, let's extend our reach a little further. We talked about a single building. All right. Let's go out just a little bit more. Now we have what is called a MAN or a metropolitan area network. This can be from a few city blocks to an entire city. 
So it can reach to basically the level of an entire city. Um, and, and this is essentially connecting multiple lands together. So if you have a large business and you have multiple buildings across the city, you may connect all these buildings together through a man network. Or if you have a college that has multiple campuses, they may be connected with a man network. They don't talk about it in um, A plus, but if you get to network plus, they also add in what's called a CAN, C-A-N, which is a campus area network, which would be something you would use for like a university. We have multiple buildings over a pretty large campus. Um, and then they would distinguish that between a, that and a man, which is more of a metropolitan area size. Kelly. Yo. Why does it seem like this is going very in depth? Like before we, before we get somewhere with the well, it's just letting you know the different types of networks that are out there because we will be talking about these as we go along more and more. No, maybe, maybe I'm I'm getting scared because I the only um I only know networking from eleven not eleven ten oh one. I don't want I don't know if it's changed any much like much since then. Not much, just uh, some of the terms have changed. Okay, so I'm not too scared. much. I'm like, the, I, yeah, I know. I haven't the, seen man yet. <laughs> Well, this was a 1001. This was a 1001 one. But um, yep, it was. <laughs> it's there. I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing is, is um, the one of the biggest changes between 1001 and 1101 is what they call things. There was okay. a lot of name updates to the similar things. That was the biggest change between 1001 and 1101. No problem. So man, metropolitan area network, size of a city. So just think of that citywide network. And then we get into the WAN, which is the largest now, which is networks much larger in geographical scale than an actual metropolitan area. This would be connecting continents together. This would be stretching across the entire country. This is a very, very large network. And you can, this could consist of multiple lands, multiple mans, the internet in general is considered a very large WAN, you know? So this is the largest we have right now. I guess eventually we'll get into another pan, which will be like a planet, planet area network. So we would have like, you know, the Earth's network and then we'll have the moons and then Mars or whatever as we stretch further and further out, you know, maybe, maybe not in my lifetime, we'll see. But uh, they haven't named or, or coined the phrase for that one yet so wham that is the largest one we will get into after that now shift gears now that we know some different physical topologies we know some other types of networks how do we interface with them with our network interface card this one provide you magic this one provides a physical connection between your computer and the network itself. And this could be either a coax, this could be an old, uh, like a serial port, I guess DB9. This could be an RJ45, it could be an RJ11, it could be fiber optic. So it could be a variety of things on there, but you have to have some way to physically interact with the network as a whole. <clears throat> And this essentially allows you to move the data um, from the RAM to the network cable itself and push the data out into the network. And it also allows it to buffer that data as it's coming in so that the computer can handle that information as it comes in, because it may come in faster or slower than it needs based off of the internal clock of the computer. All right, any questions on the NIC? This is not to be confused with your wireless card, like how you would interact with Wi-Fi. This is a physical connection. They actually have a wireless NIC, and that's how you would communicate with the Wi-Fi. It used to be, um, you had to add the Wi-Fi network after the fact, you even had to add the NIC, 
aftermarket originally. And then Wi-Fi was aftermarket as well, but they're integrating a lot of these into the motherboards now, thankfully. And your wireless NIC and your uh, regular NIC may actually have different MAC addresses, likely will, and possibly different IPs. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, we get to talk about more about binary, get into hexadecimals. All right. So each network interface device that you have, so each NIC, be it wireless or wired or what have you, has its own built-in unique identifier called the Media Access Control or MAC. So MAC address. They say no two in the world have the same MAC address, but MAC addresses can be spoofed. We'll talk about that more in security. Uh, but for the purposes of this, no two have the same. It is a series of six bytes of information broken down into hexadecimals. The first three bytes, how much is a byte? Eight bits. Eight bits, there you go. So the first three sections here are represented by the manufacturer that indicates who built that device, who made it. And then you have the last three here, which uniquely identifies that particular device. Now, we talked about binary and we talked about going from, was it zero to 255 using eight bits, right? Well, there's actually a way we can be more efficient with that by the use of something called hexadecimals. And hexadecimals actually use, instead of a byte, they use a nibble. What's a nibble? Four. Four. Four bits, so four ones and zeros. Now, these can be on or off. So how many combinations of these four bits can we get? By turning them on and off, how many different combinations can we get? 16. 16, excellent, thank you. So we can make 16 different combinations, but as we remember with original binary, zero takes a place. And we can go from zero to 15. So we have 15 capabilities. We only want to take up one space. There's a very important reason for this. So we only want to take up a single space when writing, you know, out the nomenclature. So you have, you can go from zero to nine and then they start using letters. So then they go after nine, they go A through F. And that's 10 through 15. You need to know that if you see a hexadecimal number, the only possibilities you can have are zero through nine and A through F. So if you see an H thrown in there, you know that is an invalid number. It cannot exist. They will put up hexadecimal numbers and say which of these are valid. So you can go zero through F, no higher. Now, why do they use letters other than to confuse the average person? Because how would I tell the difference between 10 and one zero? Can't, right? So if it's printed out, I would never be able to tell the difference between 10 and one zero. So that's why we started using letters, A through F. And that is where you will see these notations, why they still have letters in them. So you have the E zero CB four E nine three zero two seven eight. So that is, in essence, hexadecimals. This will come back up when we start talking about IP version six. 
but this is a basic introduction to it. I highly encourage you to take a screenshot of this to have that particular uh, graphic there that shows you the decimal number, the binary that makes it, and then the hexadecimal output. So I encourage you to take a picture of this. So for the first uh, part, so E would be um, 14. So would you say 140 or 14 zero for that first part? Where? In the example. Oh, it, this would be 14 zero. Okay. In a, in a decimal form, but to make it easy and quick to notate, it's E zero. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. Will I get a chance to practice this? You know, hexadecimal looks crazy. I want to get some practice in it. I want to work with it a little bit. Do we think we have an idea for this? Test out. Test out? Is that what we think? Cool. For Sarah. Test out for Sarah. Google. Yeah. Google. Uh, climb up, climb up. Uh, come on, we're, we got to be more fun than that. We got a video game. So we can actually play a video game on this one. All of you guys out there that have been dying to start a Twitch channel, you can be the first to initiate Flippy Bit. This is like old school Galaga where you shoot missiles at incoming uh, ships or aliens to try to get them to stop. And you have to be able to use hexadecimal to be able to do it. So, man, not everything's test out. You guys are getting a little, uh, you know, if you want it to be boring, we can make it boring. But no, we got flippy bit right here. And, and of course, uh, let's see here. I know there's a, let's see if I can find it real quick. Those of you who are worried here. That's misleading because misleading? You, you always, always like 99.9%. Can we play it on our, can we play it on and, a and, PC? And if you, yeah, you can play it on a PC. And if you think it's complicated, look here, you know, she's three, she's two years old. Look at that. Binary hexadecimal right now, knocking it out of the park. Can you play this on your phone? I don't know if or you can play it on your phone because you, you need the you need the eight key or you need the eight keys on the keyboard. So you, you, it gives you two hexadecimal digits and you got to put them in properly to be able to do it. So, you know, it is what it is. Like so, I mean, if, uh, because if I mess up, I'll be dumber than a kid. <laughs> so, hey, uh, and hey I, don't and be I, tough <laughs> on yourself. OK, their brains are sponges, literally. In reality, no, she's not playing it. It was actually somebody else playing it. They were doing that as a joke. But uh, no, Flippy Bit is a good way for you to practice. I think the record we have in a class um, is held by Diego, which is like, I think he had like 45 or 50 was the highest he ever got. Um, DW was actually getting up there too. I think he got in the high 30s. So, you know, if you want to get that, if you want to get a chance at it, it would, uh, it's just a fun way to kind of mess around with it. So today we're bringing the games. All right, so on your um, Nearpod, if you had the link in, you can click on it, be able to go to it and play it, all that fun stuff. I'll drop the link in uh, Slack as well. Uh, but yeah, you do need a standard keyboard to work on it. I've lost half the class because now everybody's playing Flippy Bit. But Diego is my uh, mentor and he, he usually offered up a challenge. Uh, I will not offer up that challenge, but his challenge used to be like, if you could beat his score uh, in one day, he would give you like 50 bucks or something like that. You afraid? 
Come on, Kelly. Uh, the- you afraid? I'm broke. Well, yeah, I'm broke too. That's the problem. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I thought she was gonna put a hundred. A hundred? Yeah. Yeah, maybe double or nothing. Maybe maybe yeah, after a couple. Like a and I'm one handed. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> so that wouldn't be fair. You gonna put some money on DW? That could be your um. That could be your guy. There you go. Put your money on DW. Yeah, DW. DW sat there playing it for a while. You got you got pretty good at it. Let's see here. Back on it. There we go. All right. So. There we go. Just a chance for a little fun. You know, rather than just grinding it out on a on a chart or what have you, um, you now can try playing a game just to kind of break it up a little bit. So after this, so we know the hexadecimals and the MAC addresses, we need to start talking about some network devices. So the main types of devices that you'll need to know with regards to 1101, you need to know what a, what a hub is what a switch is, what a router is, what a bridge is, and what a repeater is. So five main devices you need to be aware of. You go into Network Plus and a little bit higher, it gets a little more complicated, but these are the five basics that you need to be aware of. So first one is the hub. Here they show it right here in the center of the star. It is essentially a physical gathering point for cables, creating that star network. It does not do any thinking. It is a dumb device. Basically, it shouts your business out to the world. So any signal that goes into a hub gets blasted out all the other ports. So basically, you know, there is no private communication. It literally just shouts everything out to everyone. And what happens on the NIC level is, is your, your, your network interface card will see that message come across and go, is that for me? Nope, okay, I can drop it and I can ignore it. And that's typically what's happening on the back end. This creates a lot of collisions though, because everything is talking at every port. That's where that carrier sense, multiple assurance, collision detection comes into play on the computers. Um, the speeds you're capable of on these on these hubs decreases every computer you add. So each one you add, it gets a little bit slower every time. So this is also considered what is called a layer one device. So when we talk about the OSI layers, this is layer one, first layer, physical layer. So it only spits out things in binary. So as binary comes in, it goes out. So layer one device does not distinguish anything that comes in, blast it out to every terminal. These offered up a lot of security problems because you can set your NIC to what is called promiscuous mode in which it will take in every single signal that is sent out, document and log it. This is how people would look for, you know, bad things going on the network, seeing if people are sending files they shouldn't be sending. It is a old rudimentary way to kind of document everything that's happening on your networks. So hubs, layer one. it was doom, it was doom, it was doom 64, bro, I swear. Uh, come on, man. Yeah, right? Bro, it could fit on the floppy disk, bro, I swear. So everything spits out in ones and zeros. It's binary communication. We wanna up the... Uh, the ante on this one a little bit. So we're going to go to switches. Now, switches don't operate like hubs. They don't just blast everything out to every single computer. They operate off of layer two of the OSI model, which is the data layer. And this actually can route specifically to devices. So If I wanted to communicate to DW, I wouldn't need to blast my communication out in the every, everybody chat in the, in the side. I could send a direct communication to DW utilizing 
his MAC address because the MAC address identifies that specific card or that specific network device. So as soon as he plugs in, basically lets everybody know who he is, what his MAC address is, and it allows me to communicate directly with him. This breaks up what's called the collision domain. So remember we talked about on a hub, data collisions happen all the time. You have to have that CSA, carry sense multiple assurance, collision detection to deal with all the data collisions you're having. With a switch that eliminates that. So the collision domain, each collision domain is a single port on the switch. So single port creates a single collision. However, it still allows you to broadcast to everybody else if you need to. So you can create a broadcast message. So you have what are called broadcast domains and collision domains. So on this switch right here, you have one, two, three, four, five ports. So you would have five collision domains, but still a singular broadcast domain. So if I send out a broadcast message, it would go out to all five ports, but I wouldn't typically have a data collision because each individual port is its own collision domain. And again, layer two operates off of MAC addresses. It uses that as the to and from addresses. So like when I communicate with DW, I send a message, the switch sees that the sender is my MAC address and it needs to go to DW. And then he receives that information directly, it creates a direct communication. When he sends it back, it reverses. Sender information will be my, my address and, the, and then his information would be, or excuse me, he would be the sender, I would be the receiver on it. Quickest way you can speed up networks if they have hubs in place, replacing them with a switch. Because they don't have the collisions, they're able to operate at a much higher speed. Now you have two types of switches. In general, you have what are called managed and unmanaged switches. Managed switches tend to be, tend to be in enterprise settings. That is the much larger ones like you see here, where you have a lot of control how each of these ports will interact. You're managing the information flow <clears throat> on that switch. You have an unmanaged switch is typically something like you would see in your house, a smaller device like this. It basically does everything for you. As soon as something plugs in, it automatic, it just starts working. It basically figures out who's everybody's MAC addresses are and facilitates communication. And there you go. I do look at chats, by the way. So. Kelly, um, you should tell the class as well like for switches if you ever have a switch make sure that it's it's always going to be able to send your signal out but some switches aren't compatible with your internet um, speed and it could actually slow down your internet speed only because it doesn't have the capabilities of running that fast so yeah I, yeah so you, you do have to pay attention to data speeds correct absolutely yeah. um so if you have a much older switch on a newer network then you know it can slow it down it's yes. terrible when you when you have 100 up uh, like mm -hmm. 100 um uh megabits when you should really be having like a gig yes it's terrible uh, it can also yeah, happen on cables if you accidentally plug in an older cable into a newer network like if you plug in a cat 4 cable into a cat 6 network you create a bottleneck and in older yeah. older switches or you know, older switches, if you did that, you could actually bring an entire network to its knees because they can only communicate as fast as the slowest operator. That's rough. So they have other things in place now like uh, SPT, which, or excuse me, STP, which is spanning tree protocol, which allows the system to bypass those situations. But you really get more into that in say network plus, not so much in A plus. But good point, thank you for that, Adriel. No problem. I love networking. <laughs> this is fun. So that's a switch. So the switch kind of is an upgraded hub, uses MAC addresses to communicate. Now we get into a bridge. A bridge 
is essentially it creates a connection between two physically dissimilar networks. So an example of this would be going from a wired network to a wireless network. So if you're utilizing wireless access points and then you have that link to your network, you would need a bridge in order to go from that wireless signal to the wired network, going from an, uh, a twisted pair ethernet cable over to fiber optics. You need some form of bridge to change the way the signal is being transmitted so that it can continue its communication. So that is your bridge. All right, any questions on that? Hubs, switches, bridges. Um, when, when would you use bridge? Well, again, like if you had a wireless network, okay. like you had, you had a wireless mesh network set up in your building so people could come in, log in on their, their devices and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. In order for that to hook into your wired network to go out over the internet cables, you need some form of bridge to translate from wireless transmission to ethernet, twisted pair. Okay. Now, if I was just communicating, say, like, you know, you know, my son's playing a game and I'm playing a game, we're playing against each other, and mm -hmm. we're both operating wirelessly, I wouldn't need a bridge because I'm going wireless to wireless. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going wireless to wired, mm -hmm. I need a bridge because they're physically different. Okay. So that's, Thank it's you. like, an, it's like an adapter. It changes the signal. So if it's fiber optic to ethernet, it changes it from a light based signal to a copper wire. So it's an adapter. Yeah. It's that's kind of like perfect. an adapter. Yep. It's bridging. It's bridging across technologies. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Gateway. Hey, uh, one you question. Know? Sorry. Yes. So the difference between a router and a, and switch is, uh, routers connect to different networks and then switches connect to different devices basically yes so routers tend to be on the edges of the networks or between okay. between network segments and still some routers are like they have switches integrated into them right in our home devices that's where a lot of confusion comes in so like at your house you you have a router but it probably has a switch built in and also a wireless access point. So it's multiple devices in a single package. In a single package, okay. Okay, that, now, now it's getting, okay, that makes absolute sense, thank you. So, thank you, Kelly. and that's why when people use the term, like, you know, when the average person is using the term router, they're thinking of the device at their house, that kind of does everything for them. Like, well, why do we need all these devices? I have one that does everything for me. Um, so yeah, that's where a lot of the confusion comes in. Did you have a question, Brianna? Um, Babakar kind of helped dumb it down. I think he said routers usually connect to, and then hubs are multi-connects. That mm -hmm. kind of helps me. When it comes to Switch, is there any relation with Nintendo Switch, or is that just the name? It's just the name. Oh, okay. That could have been helpful to help me memorize, but if it has nothing to do with it, never mind. A switch would be like, well, I mean, if you think about it, like if you, you know, you have multiple controllers hooked up, you can have like eight controllers hooked up to the Nintendo Switch. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So but like the switch, it's not... the, so you could think of the switch as a switch and all the nodes being each individual controller you have. That actually helps me. Thank you. You see, that's why I asked. So that, that was that, actually pretty helpful. So that you know, so all of all of those all of those controllers can connect to a single device, and the, so that central device is the, the like the switch that you and connect each the controller can into, be right? The controller, like it is your screen and controller. You're overcomplicating it now. <laughs> so it does connect multiple. So the switch is what multiple uh, game controller slots would go into. Yes. So each, okay. each, each node, you know, like, so each controller would be like a node on the switch. Yeah. Okay, and that would be like, you. and that would be kind of like a star network too, where the central device was the, was the actual console. And then each controller would be a node on that network. Oh, uh, well, one thing at a time, Kelly. So there you go. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. 
All right. So that's the bridge. Next, we get into a gateway, which is very, 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 very similar to a router. <laughs> um, versa not not really hank but that's getting a little too far in the weeds so i wouldn't worry about that too much i would think about it in terms of a land at the moment all right so a gateway what a gateway does is connects two logically dissimilar networks so if i have a switch let me I can turn the annotator on might help So we got a switch here with three compute three nodes on it. I got another switch here, three nodes on it. And I got another switch here, three nodes on it. They're all connected to each switch. Now on the edge, I use like ovals. On the edge of the network, I'll connect each of these switches to a router. Or a gateway. <clears throat> and then I will connect each of these routers together like this. So Let's say the bottom is accounting, the middle one's HR, and the top is research and development. So if I'm communicating internally in this little nodes, I'd be using MAC addresses essentially. So I'm at computer one, I need to communicate with computer three. So I would use a MAC address to tell the switch, hey, go to here. Now, if I was in computer one, but I needed to communicate with computer one down here, I can't just do that through this switch, right? So the switch knows there's only three machines hooked up and I'm trying to send it to something that's not one of those three. So it'll send the information over to the router. Mm -hmm. The router is using, is operating off of the third layer of the OSI model. So the first layer was that physical layer, that was our hub. It used binary ones and zeros. Our second layer used the MAC address, which is that personal identifier for each of those network interface cards, right? And it's able to route by those MAC addresses. But now if we wanna get out into the wider internet, we have to get to the network layer, which is the third layer of the OSI model. And that routes traffic via IP addresses. Mm -hmm. So this allows me to communicate with other networks. So in order to get here, I would need to know the IP address of this computer. So I send it, it goes to the router, the router sees the IP. I know that's attached to um, HR's router or whatnot. So it sends it to this router, this router goes, yep, I know which one that is, forwards it on here says, yes, this belongs to my network, sends it into the switch. Um, after it gets in here, it then can route the traffic to its intended recipient, but it needs that third layer, that IP address. So we're connecting different networks. We have the bus network right here, which is logically dissimilar than our star networks. So we have star, bus, star. We have to use bridges or gateways to communicate with them. Does that make a little bit of sense? I do have other videos I'll show you. Mike Myers does a really good job breaking this up using children's blocks and bamboo skewers. So, so this is a hybrid, right? Yeah, this would be a hybrid network. Yes. Okay. So does this kind of make sense? So gateway, oh, gateway and router can be used interchangeably for the purposes of this. Great explanation. It helps. Yeah, this um, stuff. Uh, Kelly. Yo. Um, in, 
Okay, because bridge, I never, I, I didn't know about bridges, but I get it now. Um, when you're thinking about network devices, mm -hmm. and like for the like for the class, if when you're thinking about network devices and you're basically um dividing them into their layers, the type of communication is also important. Like how Kelly said, binary, then MAC addresses, then IP addresses. So with binary, it would be hubs. Hubs would go and send out the signal everywhere, but we don't really want that when we want privacy. Um, so if you go to switches, then they're going to basically correct the transit in terms of MAC addresses. And that's still within a local area network. So if you're not in that local area network and you want to get something else, you're going to have to go through the gateway, which would be the router and then you mm -hmm. have to use IP addresses. So you can divide the layers in terms of the language that they use to communicate with each other. Yeah, the protocols. Yeah. And when we get into uh, TCP IP, it'll break down protocols by layer. Which, which the, 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 OS, the OSI model, I did, didn't even know what that was called. I just, I just knew what they talked to each other with. Yeah. I'm learning too many technical terms. My head is right. <laughs> OSI model is is kind of the academic model used because it breaks down certain things into hard to distinguish bits uh, or chunks when you start getting into the upper layers of the OSI. Uh, Google has combined three of those layers to make it a little bit easier to understand. So they have a five layer model. And then there's a Department of Defense model, which is four layers. But again, TCPIP, when we talk about that, we'll get into that a little bit more, which is Monday. Yes, Amaya. Uh, when do you use hubs? Uh, hubs, um, you can yeah. kind of use them in wireless access points right now. So that's kind of when they're used. but. From a hardline perspective for physical wires, very rarely, if ever, would you use them now. They're a legacy device that's being phased out. They do still exist to some extent, but most networks have upgraded to switches. But can you just use a hub just to test a network and then take it off? You yeah, can, technically you could, yes. You do yeah. I had a question about bridges. So um, I mentioned before I have Apple HomeKit. I needed the bridge to connect to Google devices from Apple HomeKit. Is that the same kind of bridge or is it a different bridge? Or am I completely well? I mean, it's kind of the same thing because you're changing from different types of protocols or communication. It's like an adapter, you know. So, you know, in that case, you you need to be able to talk to a Microsoft device. So you need some way for it to know what that communication is and what protocols they're using and how to initiate that conversation. So it is kind of a bridge, yes. Okay, because I wasn't sure if it was the same kind of bridge as what's described here. I didn't want to confuse myself. It could technically fit into that box. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah, we're just having too much fun with this one. All right, routers. So this is, again, kind of like a gateway. Um, but this is basically what it does is it makes what's called forwarding decisions based on IP. If you're communicating just in the, in the star, you would use MAC addresses. If you're going to try to get outside the star, you have to use an internet protocol or IP address in order to communicate with some other machine outside of your direct network. The router itself would make a decision on whether or not to forward that on and where it needs to go. So the IP address will help direct it where it needs to go. And this is when we're going to start talking about sub networks and stuff like that we're not talking about it today don't worry but we will get into it on monday <clears throat> now on the bottom here this is an old one but this is like a home router where you're going to have multiple antennas on it this is a mo a multi-use device it does wire it does wireless it's also a switch it's a router it does everything you need it to do Actually, I had one of these um, in um, like a community that shares the same um, why well, like I wouldn't want to say network and mm -hmm. it would hop on to like the let least use network that way. Like I would have fast um, speeds all the time. Yes, is, they can. Is they that... can make forwarding decisions as well like that. But that's still 
that's that's determining like on a Wi-Fi whether you're going to use you know five gigahertz band or two gigahertz or whatnot. So it's determining which is going to operate faster, what channel bands you can use. Different, a little bit of a different conversation. So, but you're on the right path. You're just you're getting a little bit more into the weeds than what we're dealing with today. So, at home use, you'll use you would use something like this. And so again, multi-purpose device does a lot of things. In an enterprise situation, you would use a much more robust device that's typical that is capable of handling a lot more traffic, but it's also a lot more specific in its goals or its tasks. So much faster throughput, a lot more information, but it's much more specific in what it does. It's not going to do Wi-Fi. It's not going to be a switch. You're typically going to have this, and this will attach to your switch. And then from there, it would star out from there. And yes, they are a lot more money. All right. Questions on routers. Typically on the edge of your network, this is how you would go from your internal node, you know, your network segment, which would be like your star, you would need a router to connect to the bus. So in order to get out of that initial star, you need a router to make a forward decision to where the traffic needs to go from there. Make sense? Babu Kar. I don't know if uh, maybe I'm trying to go back a little bit, uh, but just for the purpose of the exam, uh, since you said Google kind of combined the first three layers, Mm -hmm. as one and then make it like sorting it to five the whole total yeah. like for the purpose of the exam are they going to ask you to list the seven layers or they're just going to ask you to list five layers i, instead of I five? don't even know if they're going to ask you to list the seven layers i don't you know um i might have gotten like one osi question on there i'm just trying to kind of give you an idea as to how these things are communicating with each other okay so I was just wondering, yeah. Yeah, no, I got you. I don't think you there's any guess. questions on the five, the five layer Google one. No. If they do anything, it'll be seven layer OSI or four layer DOD. But okay. again, we'll talk about that Monday. Thank you. What were you, what were you saying, Crystal? I didn't say anything, but thank okay, you. Okay, sorry. I thought I heard your voice. I'm sorry. It's okay. All right. So that kind of wraps up those types of network devices. We also can throw in firewalls into there, which we will talk a little bit more about firewalls as we go forward. This is a network security device, and it can either be a software item, which if you have a Windows machine, you have Windows Defender firewall on there, or it can actually be a hardware device, which is much more robust. Typically, you would put this on the edge of your network Um, to kind of create a security gap between your internal network and uh, na, 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 na. internet fire and then your internal internal networks. So you would have this layer of protection <clears throat> called a firewall, essentially. And it can allow like the physical one can allow a much more robust type of security. Uh, you have two types of firewalls that you need to be aware of. You have one is called a stateful firewall, which is basically paying attention to the state of the conversation. But all conversations must initiate from inside the network. So if I'm if I want to have a communication with Google, Google can't start that conversation with me. If they try to just send me information, my firewall is going to block it. Any communication that comes direct from the outside stops that communication. I have to request something from Google. And then when they send something back, the firewall will allow it through. So this is kind of nice. It gives you, you know, some layer of security. So you can't have people just trying to poke in from the outside. But the downfall is, is once you have initiated the conversation, the firewall assumes that all communications from that point forward until the conversation stops to be consensual. So it allows the information to flow. So once you have initiated that conversation, then it allows any data to flow back and forth at that point. 
which is why you don't click on hyperlinks from strangers because you have then initiated the conversation inviting them in past the firewall. That is a stateful firewall. In contrast, you have what is called a packet filtering firewall, which inspects every bit of data that is passing through, <clears throat> looking to see if that information is allowed to pass um, or if you're communicating with the right people. They use what is called an ACL or access control list at a basic level. So you can say, I don't want you communicating with gambling sites, adult sites. I don't want you communicating with this type of material, going to these, uh, you know, I don't want you sailing the high seas looking for free movies. You can set up control lists and there's two types of lists you can have. Um, there is, it is called a, the old way was called a blacklist. The new way is called the deny list. And what it is, is you put on there all the sites you wish to block. And then you have what's called the whitelist or the allow list. And that was only these sites are allowed. So if you're working with uh, like in accounting, they would only allow you to communicate with the Denver office, with the Ohio office, and then maybe the uh, IRS or what have you. So you can only have communications with them. Everything else is denied. So only the stuff on this list is allowed, everything else denied. On the blacklist or the deny list, it basically says all of these things are denied, everything else is okay. From an IT perspective, a allow list is much harder to maintain than a deny list because you have to continually keep adding sites every time somebody who's working for you needs to communicate with something else and talk to uh, you know some other new site, you would have to add that new site every single time. It can become very cumbersome to maintain an allow list. A deny list, every time you find something that's bad, you can just add it to the deny list. It's much simpler to maintain that than it is the allow list. Does it make sense? Are these like the ad blockers you use on your internet browser, pretty much? Where you can put like whitelist things and you get certain sites through, but if you want to like block certain kinds of uh, advertisements, you put them in the blacklist? Yeah. So that's essentially a rudimentary, like an access control list or ACL. Remember that term, ACL, access control list. That's on a packet filtering firewall. Questions? So that's what admins use to like block sites from uh, employees' computers, like let's say Facebook. Yes, they can. Yes. yes. Okay. So the firewall. There's other things you can use, but yeah, this is one of the primary tools you would use. Okay. So like maybe like the average employee is not allowed to access Facebook, but say marketing is because they would need to do it for their job. All right, how are we doing on time? All right. Now we're done with all the network devices. We can get down to some of the physical stuff here. We can start talking about cables. I know y'all have missed it since we talked about cables and connectors. You're sitting there going, you know, is really really cool stuff why didn't why didn't we continue on that conversation well it's because we wanted to wait for today so now we can continue talking about some cables and connectors that you would use for network interfacing do i need to know the differences in this stuff yes yes you do so our coaxial cable it's composed of a copper wire in the center and then they have a dielectric core kind of helps um, add strength and some rigidity to the cable. And then they have a braided shielding to help protect it from electromagnetic interference. And that is encased in a jacket. 
And there are three types of coaxial that you need to be aware of. So you have the RJ59 and the RJ58. These are the ones that you would see inside your house, coaxial cable wise. The RJ58 or the older ones, those are the ones you would use for your TV that you would kind of thread in and stuff like that. And uh, so that's the older ones, that's the RJ58. They were updated to the RJ59, which gives a much faster throughput with regards to network connections. These are still short distance. So that's the internal ones. The ones that you run from telephone pole to telephone pole to get to the internet provider, that is the RG6. It's much thicker, much more robust cable. So yeah, you do need to know the difference between these three. Do you need to know the ohms that they operate off of, the 75 ohm? No, you don't need to know that. But RG58 is the older TV, radio, Cable RG59 is your network cable, and then RG6 is your internet provider cable that they used to bring it to your house. Questions on this? Is there a physical way to tell them apart, like thickness or maybe coloring or something? Um, some of them actually have it stamped on the side for the 59 to 58. It's like, so typically your 59s will be marked, your 58s may not. Okay. But the RG6 is definitely noticeably different. It's a much thicker cable. Wait, which one is the internet provider? Is it RG6? Yeah, six, the smallest number. That's the one that goes from telephone pole to telephone pole that your internet provider uses to get it to your house, inside your house. Nowadays, you typically use the RG59 if you have cable internet, but... Mm -hmm. Your parents or grandparents probably use the RG58. And <laughs> the, the RG58 is for, it says radio communication. Yeah, old radios, like they would send uh -huh. radio signals over it. They would send TV signals over it. <laughs> okay, use, got it. Use the, yeah, use the threaded F type <laughs> connectors. Like the one you would use to connect to your old like tube TV to your like your Nintendo? Yep. There you go. Okay. Tell me. Yo. So RG59, 6, and 58, they all can have different um, connectors? Well, typically, your RG58 would have an F-type connector. Um, the RG6 would go directly into a box, and then yeah. typically hardwired from there. And then your RG59 would have your BNC connector. Anybody remember the BNC? Yeah. I think, I think so either I have it wrong here, but I think... Uh, it's 58 is the one that uses the BNC connector. That's what the lock and twist, you push it in, you twist it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the network connections, um, 59 uses as well. And one of them has a latch, right? I can't remember. Yeah. I mean, you can use, you can interchange F and BNC for either of these. I'm saying typically, because this is home use, you would see the F type. And then in offices, you would see the 59 for the older bus networks and they use the BNC. And the RG stands for radio grade, right? I believe so. Yeah, radio grade. So here's the reminder. The BNC has the little posts that go in and twist lock. The F connector has it. It's threaded like a screw. So it fits down over, screws down. If you're going to be moving things around more frequently, you're going to want the F type because it's easy to for quick disconnect. Uh, if things are in place in a more permanent sense, so you're not moving it that often, F connectors would typically be used. Um, quick question, Kelly. Are these still being used or is uh, uh, fiber optics more uh, common these days? Anybody here have cable internet? Yes, I have. And uh, the F connector, is it the one that goes to your wall? The one they have that network well, no, 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 no. The F connect, the F connector is just the end of the cable. But the end of the cable, you okay. could put either one of those there. So, okay. 
the these are the ones that would go through so you would have the rg58 rg59 which you would see internally in the house and again the rg6 is what runs along the telephone wires they may run an rg59 from the pole to the house oh, okay um kelly i have a question it's cynthia yes ma'am so i just moved uh in like in this apartment where i live and uh some of this stuff uh verizon were pre-installed before I move in the apartment, right? Mm -hmm. So they put those things in the closet. You know, they they the walk-in closet when you get in the in the apartment right by the door. Okay. So is it safe? Because I, I really like want to use that closet to put like a storage, but I feel like you know how you cannot put stuff around electric um thing because well, it can I, cause fire. Well, it wouldn't it's not that it would cause I mean it can overheat, yeah. But I mean I wouldn't stack anything up next to it. So I would leave like, you know, at least a couple inches so that it can breathe. But yeah, it's that's there. Is it safe um, to use it like that place as a storage or not? Would you yeah. like, do you have to Yeah, handle, I just like... I just I just wouldn't stack things on it. But oh. yeah, you can you can use the room. That's fine. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that would be, you know, that'd be kind of messed up if they took a whole walk-in closet and just put a router in there and said, like, yep, can't use this. This whole room belongs to Verizon. <laughs> That's how it is right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can use it. But again, I wouldn't like lay clothing. Like I wouldn't stack towels on top of the uh, the router or the switch or lay jackets over it. You know, yeah, just make sure that it's okay by itself. And then, you know, a cut like an inch or two away from it on the, on the shelf or whatever, you can stack more stuff in there or hang coats up or what have you. Got it. So, digital antennas still use the the RG cables, the coaxial. Digital cable or digital antennas? Yeah, like I, I bought one recently to receive, um, you know, uh, radio frequencies. I mean, okay. Frequencies and it's like it looks, looks just mm -hmm. like coaxial. Like yeah, that's what well, that's what it is. That is coaxial, but that's uh, this is the the technical name from is the RG fifty nine fifty eight and six. How come the digital receivers still use those coaxial cables? Because we are now able to push digital signals, we figure out how to push digital signals over the copper wires. Okay. So it's basically we have it. We had a huge amount of infrastructure based around coaxials, so we had to find a way to um, still utilize that technology, but utilize it a little better than it was being used. So where before we were pushing analog uh, signals over it for TV, now we can push digital signals over it and um, increase our capabilities. So it's just cost. <laughs> that's the answer. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, and that's kind of holding, you know, it's being held together by like bubble gum and duct tape at the moment. And then eventually, hopefully we will upgrade to fiber optics and that will, you know, exponentially increase our ability to communicate. So. All right. So B and C, anybody remember what it stands for? Uh, and that um something i forget the other two yeah all right bayonet can you repeat the question what do you say what does b and c stand for oh oh man bayonet <laughs> network connector not network a connector c c stands for somebody else's name no neil is n n stand for neil yeah neil, there you go artes neil, neil. bayonet right. neil Connector, <laughs> councilman, councilman. Oh, yeah. Three, it's three oh, people's name. Um, yeah, three names. Bayonet, yeah. Neil, councilman. Yep. So, just seen. All right, coaxial still kind of a legacy technology, still kind of holding on. There's still some people out there still have cable internet. I'm one of those people. Um, but other types of network media out there one of which is what's called shielded twisted pair or STP. There's also unshielded twisted pair, which we will get into as well. But STP is the same thing as unshielded twisted pair, except it has this fun little foil around it right here, uh, which helps protect it from electromagnetic interference. So, and it is a twisting of eight wires eight wires twisted together for the RJ45. It's two pairs for the uh, RJ11. And then this one here has a uh, Kevlar thread through there just to kind of add some strength to the cable. So don't really pay attention to this right here. Yes, Ramon. No, I was gonna ask you about that one. 
the ones so, yeah, that, that don't pay attention to. Yeah, we don't really need to worry about it. It's just a Kevlar thread, and all it's doing is just adding strength to the cable. That's all it is. So does anybody know why they twist the wires together other than to make it diff, you know, more annoying for technicians to undo to be able to set up the uh, connectors? To stop cross To there keep it go. neat. Not to keep it neat. Ramon had it there to stop crosstalk. So if the, if the cables are all running straight through, the actual signals would start to jump between the wires, creating what's called crosstalk and jumbling up the signal. So what they do is they twist them together and the way they make the twists, the cables are always touching each other at a right angle, They're, thereby limiting the amount of crosstalk that can happen. So that's why they twist them together and that's why we get twisted pairs. Um, so this is, you know, this is a shield twisted pair. Some more expensive shield twisted pair would actually have foil around each individual pair. So you may see that as well. It's a metallic shielding, like the RFID blockers. Yeah. So it's like, a, it's, it's not, an, it's not, yeah, kind of like that. Yes. But yeah, they'll, they'll use a foil around it to block any um, external electromagnetic interference. Yes, Cynthia. So, <clears throat> sorry, when I was uh, going through this uh, connections, um, you know, the way I got it right um, is it's the structure and the function it sounds like a neuron. I don't know if you know the neuron communication. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is how I was able to like ace the, the quizzes on um, Coursera. Okay. Because <laughs> the structures and the, the communication and the reason why they have the sheath, the sheath is yes. like how the, neur the neuron is structured and uh, functions. Yeah, because the sheathing protects the communication going through the neurons. Yes. And if, if you, and that's yeah. like, there's some mental disorders that the sheathing starts to strip and then it causes essentially cross communication and then yes. can lead to <laughs> mental degradation, right? Absolutely. That's how I got it. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, that's a good way to think of it. If that works for you. So this is the shielding version. And again, it's for the standard Ethernet cables, it's four pairs of twisted wires. Old school POTS lines were two pairs of twisted wires. Here it is again without the shielding. So that's the only, the only difference between this one and this one is the original one has that foil to protect it from EMI. UTP does not have that. And it, this is one of the most common ones you use. These are the ones you use in your house, the little three foot cables that you use to connect your box to your internal Wi Fi or whatever, or your computer to a, a hub or a switch or whatever. This is typically what you're using. And then it has a PVC sheathing around it to kind of keep everything together and kind of protect it. So most used tends to be the least expensive. And then you have two types of wires. They may have the braided wire in there or they may have solid core. Solid core is more expensive, which means it's a single copper wire. Uh, some of them may have braided wires in there which break a little bit easier, uh, but it's less expensive. Solid core tends to be used in what are called horizontal runs. And that's typically between your, like internally in your walls is what they mean by that. So they would run those through the inside of the walls, not typically from computer to computer, because the solid core is less flexible. It's more of a rigid cable. All right, here are different kinds of UTP categories. We will get into this a little bit, but this is kind of the evolution. So you have the CAT3 um, and CAT4. I think CAT3 is still RJ11, so the four wire ones. CAT4 gets into eight, but it only uses four of the wires, and then it slowly evolves as you get up. What do I need to pay attention with regards to this? You need to pay attention to the data rate and the max cable length. It's almost always the same, 100 meters, but there are certain notations. So the CAT5E typically gets gigabit speed for only 55 meters, and then it drops off. Same thing for the CAT 6A. It gets gigabit ethernet speed only for 55 meters, then it drops off. 
but it can still transmit up to 100 meters. The rest can transmit at their normal speeds beyond 100 meters. Once you exceed 100 meters, you get what is called attenuation. And that basically means like the signal's getting jumbled, it can't really communicate very well. So that's your maximum length on a cable. All right. Any questions on this? Nope. All right. All right. So getting a little bit easier. Now we talk about connectors. We got to start using these technical terms in class. So instead of saying an ethernet cable, we want to talk about UTP or STP, unshielded twisted, uh, shielded twisted pair, getting a little more specific. Our connectors, our old POTS lines with the four wire, that is our RJ11, which is a little more of a square connector. And then you have your RJ45, which is more rectangular and has the eight pins at the bottom. Yeah, here. I'm going to pause right here. So, continuing on our journey for networking, we'll be talking about, we talked about shielded twisted pair and unshielded twisted pair. The only real difference between the two being that little foil around it. We need to talk about wiring standards for the RJ45 cables. So, you have two different standards that they go by pretty much throughout the industry. You have the T568A and the T568B. B is the most popular. Some say you get better throughput because they have more twist per inch. I'm not sure I'm for those particular I'm sorry, pairs. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. These up? are RJ45. RJ45. J45. RG is coaxial. RJ is network. So yes. RG45, this is what it looks like on your internet cable. You see that little dotted line here that's that little clip on the top of that cable so the clip is on the other side of this picture so we're looking at the bottom of the connector at this point so you have the two different standards don't worry we have a mnemonic to help you remember how they go but we do need to know the order in which they go and if you pull out, if you have an Ethernet cable laying around, I'm still pulling out if you're using it right now, but you can look at the bottom of it and you can tell whether or not you have B or A. And B, it always goes, whether it's B or A, regardless, it goes stripe, solid, stripe, solid, stripe, solid, stripe, solid. So it always alternates those. So if you get hung up and you don't know if it was a, you know, if it was a stripe or solid next, it always alternates stripes and solids. So B, you have orange stripe, orange, green stripe, blue, blue stripe, green, solid, brown stripe, brown. And then for A, green stripe, green, orange stripe, blue, blue stripe, orange, brown stripe, brown. If you notice, the only colors that are changing are the oranges and the greens. Blues and browns don't move. The only difference between the two is you're swapping the oranges and the greens. The blues stay in four and five, seven and eight, four or five, seven and eight. They don't move. That's it. <clears throat> now, mnemonic, I have it at the end of the thing, but we'll just kind of go over real quick. So for type B, it's under, it's the sun to the sky, so orange is, you know, like the sun. So sun to the sky and the river throw, flows between the trees on a, on a sunny day, or excuse me, the river flows between the trees. <gasps> so you have sun to the sky, orange up top, and then the river, the blue, flows between the trees. And obviously, 
brown to the ground. So sun to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river flows between the trees. That's fine. <laughs> or T five sixty eight A. What's up? That was that was that was a good way of explaining it. For real. So say it's similar on the T five sixty eight. It's trees to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river flows on a sunny day. So you got the orange surrounding the river. So trees to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river flows on a sunny day. Five sixty eight B. Sun to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river flows between the trees. We have it later where you guys can take a snapshot of it. I'm just kind of showing it to you visual, visually. So this kind of making sense. So if you're setting up a connector for your cable, these are the two different ways you would set it up for now. So here it is. Take a screenshot of this, please. Trees to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river runs on a sunny day. That's your 568A. Sun to the sky, brown to the ground, and the river runs between the valley. I guess they use a valley rather than trees. I learned trees. So yeah, take a screenshot of this. All right, the all important plenum cable. You will receive at least a couple questions about this one cable. So remember we were talking about the unshielded twisted pair had a sheathing of PVC, you know, like a PVC plastic coating. Who knows what happens when you burn PVC? You get black smoke mm -hmm. that kills you, right? You can't through. Black smoke and it's toxic. Yeah. Um, a lot of internet cabling and stuff is run through the drop ceilings in offices. And in older buildings, they actually can run the network cabling through the air conditioning vents. You do not want something that can burn and release toxic chemicals sharing an airspace with humans essentially. So they have a plenum uh, cable. It is more expensive. It is naturally shielded, which is wonderful. They have the uh, shielding that goes around each set of wires and it is extremely fire resistant. Like you can take a blowtorch to this stuff and it'll start to melt, but it won't really catch fire and smoke. So anywhere where you're going to have um, you know, airspace essentially with humans, HVAC, drop ceiling, stuff like that. You must run plenum cable for coding, like to be up to, to code essentially, because it is fire resistant. So whenever you hear anything about fire resistance, plenum. If you're running between floors or you're running through HVAC C systems, plenum. At least two to three questions you will receive just on this. And this is a gimme. So please make mental note of this. Do not forget. Questions? Well, this, is, this is defined as a shield uh, uh, twisted pair. I'm sorry, you said what? This is defined as a shielded uh, twisted pair. Well, it is, it is shielded, yes. But this is specifically called plenum because of the fire resistance. Not all shielded... Twisted pair is plenum, but all plenum is shielded twisted pair. 
Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Because of the, the coating on the outside on the plenum doesn't catch fire, it doesn't melt. The other one is PVC, it will catch fire and then it releases a very toxic gas, which is chlorine, I believe it's chlorine gas if I remember correctly. And that is no good for people. All right, onward. I know y'all are bored talking about shielded twist pairs and Ethernet cables and RJ45 and coaxial. Want something a little more interesting? Awesome. Fiber optics. The only one of the network, physical network communications that is completely immune to electromagnetic interference. Because it uses light instead of electricity, right? <clears throat> so the data is transmitted by injecting either light by either a laser or an LED light into this cable, and it sends the information along it to the receiver on the other end. The beautiful part about this, it is able to transmit data over a much longer distance than either coax or twisted pair. Because remember, our, our limit on twisted pair was what? 100 meters and we can't go beyond that, that right and if we want to go further than 100 meters we have to have a repeater something that can be used as a cheap repeater a hub because it repeats that signal and sends it on in a pinch you can use one for that but typically you would want to use a repeater an actual device specifically for that but in a pinch you can use a hub for that so it can carry a much longer distance. So instead of 100 meters, some of the uh, LED, or excuse me, some of the uh, fiber optics can go up to 40 kilometers. That's how they were able to run them across the entire ocean. Every 40 kilometers, they had to hook up a repeater though, but they ran a single one of these cables all the way across the ocean. Every 40 kilometers, drop another repeater. Every 40 kilometers, drop another repeater because that direct line connection is significantly faster than trying to do it over radio signals. <clears throat> and, it, you know, so it's longer distances and higher speeds at the same time, both at the same time. Although that does come at a much higher price tag. There's two distinct categories of fiber optic. You have what's called single mode fiber, which transmits very high speeds over greater distance greater distances, but it costs more. And then you have multi-mode fiber, which allows you to transmit multiple signals through the same line at the same time using different spectrums of light. Also high speed, but not as far. It can't travel as far as the single book. Here's kind of what it looks like. So you have single mode, single light passes all the way through. Multi-mode, you would have like a different color of light for each one of these transmitters. So one may be orange, one may be green, one may be blue. And sending different, then those different colors of light would transmit the data needed. And on the other end, the receiver would break things up based on the color of light coming through. But because it's bouncing around more and there's more light coming through, it can't go as far. Single mode typically uses a laser and much higher power can go over a much longer distance. Questions? Also make note of the structure. You have the core, which is, um, which is where the actual light is traveling down, surrounded by a cladding, which kind of helps protect it and gives it more of an interior reflective surface to help transmit the light along. And then you have a strengthening member that's gonna thicken it up, make it so that it's not as easy to break. And then you have the outer jacket, which is typically a PVC or plenum, something along those lines. Because if you just had the actual fiber line, it's very, very fine, but also very delicate.
Huh? One second. Kelly. Five, yo. Sorry, I, you may have said this, but what what would they use multi multi mode fiber for? That would typically be like um, that would be uh, what we call short runs. So that would be like um, from building to building. Like if you're on a campus, you could run from one building to another building. You can run it from one floor to another floor, um, something like that. You would use single mode or you know the yeah the single mode fiber for much longer distances, things that are like two to ten kilometers away, stuff like that. So you're going much further. Copy. Good looking. Mm -hmm. So multi-mode, shorter distance, single mode, much longer distance. Do I need to know these ethernet standards right here, that 100 base X, 100 base F, FX, SX and SR, or 1000 base LX and LR? Yes, you do. Keep in mind, when you see the number at the front, that's your, your megabits per second. So you see this for coaxial, this this nomenclature you will see it for coaxial you will see it for um ethernet cables and you will see it for fiber optics this is essentially setting up the standards so when you see 1000 base it means 1000 megabits per second base means baseband and then lx they usually have like a different name for any one of these but the quick way to remember that when you see the l that's long haul, long distance. So that will always be single mode. So LX and LR, long distance, L. Two kilometers and 10 kilometers. Then S for short haul <coughs> and F for fiber. Just remember those three are multi-mode, but it's a shorter distance. And then again, the number in front of base is your speed in megabits per second. So 100, 1000, 10,000, so 10 G base, and you see that it it measures up right here. So 1,000, 1,000 megabits per second, 1,000, 1,000 megabits per second, 100, 100 megabits per second, 10 G, 10 gigabits per second. It's the same numbers. So instantly, you know the speed, you know it's a uh, baseband, and then these last two letters on the end tell you what the medium is. Make sense? Four main fiber optic connectors you need to be familiar with. So some of these are easy to remember. Square connector, it has a square box. So square connector, SC, square connector. Straight tip, the fiber cladding protrudes out of it, and it actually uses a B and C connector, much like coaxial, but ST, straight tip. So the tip comes out. And this is typically a multi-mode connection. Lucian's connector, also square like the square connector, but it has a little clip on there that makes a, you know, somewhat of a L-shaped connection. So you have that little L on there, let that, you know, kind of link you to the Lucian's connector. Do I need to know these? Yes, yes you do. And then the oddball of the family, there is the MTRJ, which has two fiber optic strands in a single connection. And it's also the only one of the four, which is a miniature form factor. So it's a much smaller connector. So MTRGA, longer name, has two wires on it. Square is square, Lucient has an L, straight tip has a protruding tip sticking out of it. Questions on this? All right. Quiz time. Let's see here. George. 
What's number one, please? Sorry, is muted. Square. Is it square? Okay. okay. Square, well, I um, need more. I need more details, man. Square optical. It's fiber optic. Square. Is it ST, SC, LC, MTRJ? Uh, SC. There you go. Square connector. Excellent. And my hand twitched on that one. All right. Steven, number two, please. It's after lunch, so your mic is taking a break. <laughs> Kelly. Good? Yeah, I got you now. There okay, you that's super weird. You're right, though, every time after lunch. Okay, um, I want to say, oh, man, is, it, is this one the BNC connector? It is a BNC connector. What type okay. of medium is it, though? It is... Looks like a looks like a little copper wire in there. Right. Is that a coaxial cable? That is a coaxial cable. There you go. What would we use for networks? Um that was for uh damn. Getting some help in the chat here. Okay, let's see. 59? I'm not okay. sure what that so, is. So we got we got the last part of it. Now we just need the first part. Oh, so B59. That's so okay. It's a BNC coaxial something something 59. Oh, wow. It's so we know sure. the connector. We know it's a coaxial cable. But what kind of coaxial cable is it? There we go. We're getting some help in here again. RG. There you 59. go. RG59, mm. that's your network cable for coaxial. Okay. And it is a B and C connector. Very good. You guys, are just see, you guys are just seeing this today. So don't be, you know, don't knock okay, on Okay, yeah. Me. I'm trying this to like, look through my notes to see if I have that. I must have it, but just want to make sure. So. <laughs> RG59. Boom. Devin. Can you please help us out with number three? Who did you say? Devin, Devin. He's off mute. Number three, top center right here. What are we looking at? I know it could be one of the other, but I don't know which one it is. What does it look like to you? Why don't, why don't we just start with describing exactly what it is first? One of the Ethernet cables? <laughs> Ethernet cable? Okay, we're getting there. Now, does that look like... Does that look newer or older? Getting some help in chat? Don't be afraid to get it wrong, Deb. RG11? RG11, excellent. It's RJ11, but yes. RJ11. Oh, yeah, RJ11. Excellent. RJ11, yes. What is the other term we would use to describe this phone line? Silly name. Yeah. Pots. 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 What does that stand for? Phone. Plain old Plain old tele Plain. telephone service. There you go, oh. television. Plain old telephone service. Pots. So it's very old legacy lines. Good work, Devin. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Noted, Adrian. <laughs> so here we go. RJ. 11, can, can anybody else tell me anything else about this? Is there anything unique about it? So, how many pins? Four pins. Eight. Four pins. Anything Eight. else? 
Got four pins, four pins. Oh, shucks, I'm saying. <laughs> plain old telephone what? Plain, plain old telephone service. It also it's, comes in two pins. It also what? Uh, twisted? Yes, twisted pair. It also comes in two pins, right? They do have some in two, yes. Yeah, some older lines will use two. But yeah, so they do two or four. And it is a twisted pair as well. This is where they figured out how to eliminate crosstalk. You know, it was in the old school phones. They could get longer runs out of the phone lines without twisting the, when they twisted the lines together. All right. Up next, Madison, can you please tell us what number four is? Yes, you can. Come on. I was, <laughs> um, <laughs> you were what? It wasn't even here. I just got oh, back. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, Enrique, can you tell us what number four is, please? Bottom center, number four, right here. ST? ST, what does ST? that stand for? Straight tip connector. Straight tip connector, awesome. What type of connector does it typically use? See like a little uh -huh. round one here, it's got little po like a little, little post sticking out of it. Uh, I don't know. They use it for like older connectors, you know, looks like the other side of it. I've never seen like that. that cable in my life. <laughs> Well, the older cable, like the uh, coaxial, uses something similar to it. What do we call it? Coaxial? Coaxial, but yeah, but what is the connector? You're getting some help in chat? Yeah. Uh, hmm, BNC? BNC, but there I you go. I don't F know what that stands for. <clears throat> Bayonet Neil Councilman. Oh. oh <clears> it's just the name of the three, it's the name of the three yeah. people who designed it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, Bonnie and Clyde, bro. Remember it is Bonnie, go, Bonnie and Clyde. Clyde. There you go. Yes, yes. Uh, the My F type is a threaded connector. Today. No worries, no worries. We will get there, Enrique. Good work. All right, Kayla, can you tell me what number five is, please? Why do you have to pick me? <laughs> well, you said that was a L shape. What is it like? M T. Yes, L. I forgot. I'm so bad with the acronyms, but oh, Lucent. Oh, it's the L shape gets you right to the acronym. So yeah, L L C. Wow, L C. I, I there you go. Literally just said that. I don't know why my brain is not working, guys. <laughs> but thank you. There you Here go. goes my fam getting my back. Thank All you. All right, L C. L C. Excellent. Cynthia, can you take us home? What's number six? Right here. Uh, sorry, kid, I'm on and off, so but I'm here uh, paying attention, okay? No problem. All right, Galen. What do we have right here? Number six, bottom right. Hello? Yep, there you go, Gail. Yeah, um, RJ45. RJ45. Excellent. That is exactly the connector. What do we usually use an RJ45 for? Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Um, I, I think it's uh, Ethernet. Ethernet. Ethernet connector. Okay. Well, more specifically, what type of medium would we call that? So it's Ethernet, but we want to be a little more specific. It has a bunch Rob of wires wrapped around it, each other inside of it. A bunch of wires wrapped around each other inside of it. Um, what would we call that? Get some help in chat. Nick? No. Nope. Nope. Not Nick. Oh, That's twisted good. pair. I see it. There you go. Twisted pair. So it is a twisted pair cable. We don't know whether it's shielded or not from this angle, but we know it's twisted pair. It's an RJ45. How many pins do we have? Um, Mm -hmm. 
Eight? Yes. Eight pence. I'm sorry, guys. I'm looking through my... Oh, it's in the chat. Eight. Don't, hey, don't worry about it again. Again, my notes, guys. My first notes. time seeing it today. Don't be afraid to get it wrong. Kelly, RJ11. Four pens? Four pins, RJ11, yes. It's squarish in shape, so it's more square. RJ45, double the pins, and it is more rectangular. So, good work, everyone. So, RJ45, twisted pair on that last one. Nice work, especially considering y'all hadn't seen this before. Networking tools that you may come across on a regular basis in the field. So right here you have a crimper, which is what you would use to put the RJ11 or RJ45 connectors onto the wire itself. Once you've threaded those wires into that connector, you put them in this little device here and you clamp it, clamp it down like a pair of pliers and it basically it pushes little metal blades up to punch into the wire so that you get that firm connection and then it clamps down on the actual cable itself so that it's firmly adhered there. This particular one does both RJ11 and 45. You can see a larger gap right here where you'd put the RJ45 and then there's a more squarish one off to the side that you could do the RJ11. It's called a crimper. Looks like a big pair of pliers. Now, over here, we have a punch down tool. This is what you would use on the other end. Like if you're installing an, you know, a port in the wall, you would have to push these down into a punch down block is what they call it. <clears throat> and this is kind of U-shaped. And interestingly, so it's got like a little bit of a U-shape. There's your tool here. And then it's got like a little blade on the other. So one side is flat, the other one has a blade. And what that does is, is once it, one side pushes it down into the connector, the other side cuts the other end of the wire off so that it sits flush. So you don't have chunks of wire hanging out. So it's pretty efficient. And it's called a punch down tool. I'll show you a picture of a punch down block, like an outlet you would see, so you can kind of see what it looks like. Questions on these two? Are we using these tools to create our own RJ45s? I'm not sure. If they're yes, to yes, you would. Okay. So if you wanted to run wire, like if you wanted to run um, twisted pair cabling in your house, you would need a crimper to create little, you know, Ethernet cables for yourself if you wish, and you would need a punch down block to be able to create the outlets for yourself. Or if you know, if you're setting up a patch panel in order to set up, you know, to thread the wires or feed the wires into the patch panel so the patch panel can communicate with what are called your horizontal runs, which are the wires that run through your walls. So the ends of the connectors on a typical RJ45, those little plastic pieces, that's what we're using to create them? This tool right here, yes. Okay, got it. The crimper, you, you would have the little plastic pieces with nothing in it. You would, th you would use your wiring guy to do the T5, uh, was it T538A and B? Or, and then you would thread the wires in properly, and then you would crimp down the connector on the end of it, and that would make your cable for you. Now, how do we know if we made the cable correctly? We could have misplaced the wires, crossed them, what have you. Um, we have something called a cable tester right here, where you can plug one end of the cable in here, one end of the cable into the other. These, device, these two pieces right here can actually separate. So if they're in different rooms, you can still communicate. And what it does is it sends a signal down each wire individually and will tell you if the signal is received on the other end. So you can actually test the cable to make sure it was made properly. It has no shorts, no broken pieces, something like that. So this is a cable tester used to connect, you know, test your cables after you've made them. Is it like this? Is it, ill advised to, is it ill advised to buy your own like from Amazon? Cause you know, they, how they have different lengths. Is there yeah. a reason why we're making our own? Is it better to do it that way or? Less expensive. You can buy a whole spool of cable and a box of uh, connectors and you can probably save 
50, 60 percent, I guess. Gotcha. Okay. As opposed to buying each individual cable. Um, <laughs> it goes back yeah. to cost. <laughs> yeah, it comes back to cost. If you're running cable, you don't want to buy each individual cable from Amazon because you lose all your profit. So, you know, if you can make cables quickly and efficiently, you save a good amount of money. It's cool to yeah, know. You can make them your own length too. So you don't yeah. have like 20 feet of cable to go three feet. Yeah. Or if you only need to go two feet, you don't need to make a three foot cable or something like that. You know, if you need to go five feet, you can make yourself, you can make it two length for your needs. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. One of the guys in our, uh, in my cohort, when we were still on site, um, did a lot of this stuff in real life. So he brought in a whole spool of cable for the class and literally just sat down and did a workshop on making cables and everybody was sitting there making cables for like one afternoon. I would love to do that. So it was really cool. And he was, he was a student. He wasn't, it wasn't the teacher of the TA. He was literally just a student. He's like, yeah, I got some extra cable from the job I did a while ago. I'll bring it in and we'll just sit there and we'll actually practice making cables and taught everybody how to do it and all that stuff. It was really cool. Um, but this is uh, the punch down block. So this would clip into the back of the port or the outlet on the, on the wall. And you have, you can see these colors right here. And that gives you the color guide or layout so that you know exactly where to put each wire. And then as you push the wire down, it cuts the wires off on the end so that it's nice and flush. That's why you have to punch down so you can see the blade on the end of the punch down. All right, questions so far on that? All right, so here you can see the tool that Bubba Car was talking about earlier. This is the Toner Pro. And basically what this does is you have a device here that you plug into one of your network cables and it sends a musical tone through the wire. So if I'm working on a computer at a desk and I think there may be a problem at the switch, I and the switch wasn't properly marked as a technician, this allows me to be able to find that, that port quickly because I can run this probe, which is going to look for that, that musical tone across each of the wires, and then it'll play it out for me once it hits it. The caveat here is once that tone goes into a switch, it gets eaten. So you cannot trace the tone beyond the switch. The switch eats the tone. You lose it. But prior to that, you can catch it before it goes into the switch. So that is a toner probe. The other name they use for this, does anybody know the other name they use? Tone generator. Tone generator, well, that's this, that's the half of it. That is a tone generator here, and that is the probe. A fox and hound. There you go, fox and hound. That is the other name that they use for this particular tool. Why is that? What's, what's the reasoning? Behind well, that? it's like the fox hunting. You have the fox that's running and the hound is chasing it. So this is sending the signal out and then you're using the probe to find that signal, chase the signal. So it's called a fox and hound. Is there a career in like this kind of stuff? Because it's the stuff that I like, <laughs> like things like this. You do what? I said, is there a career based on stuff like this? Because it's the kind of stuff that I like, like uh, the tools and everything, stuff like that. But using the like lay doing the the yeah cabling like laying out mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah oh yeah cool you know every time they build a new building they got to lay cabling right so there are some places you can go and you can bid for these jobs and you can do them you can do them for like individual offices sometimes for entire buildings um, but yeah there are opportunities for that um, they multimeter call, they call them cables right yeah. they call them cables cable mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> And you, you, basically, you call them in for, <laughs> yeah, you call them in for running uh, what they call horizontal runs. Mm -hmm. All right. And you got a multimeter here that will test voltage. So if you have a problem with your power supply, you can use this to test for the power supply. It also does fun things like test for continuity. Um, so you can see if like there's breakages in the wire, you're getting proper throughput on the wires, things like that, or if there's a connection at all. All right. Okay, 
Last one we're gonna I think we're gonna talk about <clears throat> is something called a loopback plug. So the loopback plug basically takes the output of your NIC, so the, the signals as it's going out of your NIC, and literally loops it back to the input of your NIC. So anything that would go out, it immediately loops it back into your NIC. And what this does, this tool serves one purpose, and that is to test and see if your NIC is actually functioning. So what you do is you plug this in, <clears throat> and if you see the, the light lighting up on your network card, then you know your NIC is working. So it's just a quick and easy way to test it. It's a small little piece uh, that you can keep in your uh, tool bag. Um, I keep one, you can make one yourself. Um, and I'll show you on the next page real quick how you can do that. It's, it's pretty quickly, you just take two wires and you literally take it from two of the pins and wire them back into two of the others and you have a homemade loopback plug. They're also really inexpensive to buy too. So basically what you're doing is you have your output. So say one and two is your output. It's going to go to the input, which would be three and six. That's what a loop pack is doing. So it's going from one and two, looping back to three and six. There are a couple different types of cables that can be made. Two that you really need to be aware of for the A+, and that is a straight through cable which basically means if I'm using T568 on one side of the cable, it's using T568A on the other side of the cable. So it's the exact same on both sides. That is called a straight through cable or a patch cable. The other type, and the other type is called a crossover cable. So if you have T568A on one side, you would have T568B on the other. What this allows us to do, like originally, this was used to connect switches together. So you would take a crossover and you would connect one switch to the other. 